Okay, physics of mobility. Let's talk about that. So physics of mobility means physics of the scattering. The why something scatters and how fast it scatters. Again, that same picture of electronic potential moving up and down and an electron trying to move it. This was the original picture and we replace it with the effective mass. Now, the first type of scattering that we'll be talking about is ionized impurity scattering or impurity scattering. And I'll explain the physics, but let's first look at it from this point of view. Assume that I had a series of identical atoms. I take out one atom, put back a new atom in. When I put back a new atom in, its potential is not the same as before, right? Obviously not. So in that case, let's say I move back that electron in. Now, if I wanted to keep my description of effective mass, then what do I need to do? Then I need to say, okay, I really, I have the red potential, but I will approximate it with my original blue one and put that potential in the effective mass and anything remaining, the difference between the red and the blue, I will put it as an extra potential. You see, at this extra potential, when this electron with this effective mass is moving, as if it will scatter against this extra potential. And when it does so, then it will cause the friction and this will slow down the electron. Okay. Now, how, how does it look physically? One way to think about it is think about a piece of semiconductor, right? Donors sitting at random points, decorating it as random points. The donors have given away its electron. Now it is positively charged, right? So it's like a pudding with raisins sitting on top, all positively charged. Now an electron is coming in. As soon as it comes in close to a donor, it says that don't go directly. It will try to bend it towards itself, right? And the electron motion will continuously be bent by these positive charges. And this is, so it's perturbing its potential momentum, and this is a scattering. And this is called a ionized impurity scattering, because only when it's ionized, then it's going to scatter. Same for the acceptors. Negative charge, when electron comes in, it says the negative star sitting in that space, and it scatters. Okay. And we will discuss a little bit more on that. Now, this is something you are not supposed to learn in this course. You'll, you'll learn in detail in another course, in 656, for example. But the point is, this extra piece of potential with a little bump in the speedway, that potential, if I call it U, it is possible to easily calculate how frequently electrons scatter by a specialized formula, and that formula is called Fermi-Golden Rule. Now, all I'm saying is that there's a way to calculate it. I'm not telling you exactly how to calculate it. It will not be in the exam, so don't worry about it. But the point is, this is how people would calculate this, this type of scattering. So there is two types of scattering that are of great interest. That slows down the electron, right? One is called a phonon scattering, and the second is one called ionized impurity scattering. Now, ionized impurity, I just explained, right? When you have these charges, and they try to deflect the electrons, slow them down in the process, ionized impurity scattering. And the ionized impurity scattering is inversely proportional to the number of ionized donors. Does it make sense? If you have more, right, it will scatter more frequently. And therefore, the time will be shorter, right, for the scattering. So it's inversely proportional to n sub d. If you have n sub a acceptors, then it should be a propor inversely proportional to n sub a. Now, why is it just n sub d? Why is it not n sub d squared or something else? The reason is, remember, the donor's atoms are very few, relatively speaking. 10 to the power 22 number of atoms, silicon atoms, right? How many donors? 10 to the power 18, maybe. So they are far apart. And so once the electron scat scatters with one, then it forgets about that electron, that scattering altogether. It goes a long way before scattering one more time. Therefore, it's linearly proportional. If they were very close together, heavy density, heavy doping effect, then I couldn't simply say it's one over ND, you see? Okay. Now, why t to the power three halves? Well, that has to do with screening of the electrons because anytime a positive atom sits, it doesn't sit alone. It sort of brings around it a bunch of other electrons to screen it. And so when a new electron comes in, it not only scatters with the positive one, but it's sort of surrounding, it's like a king and the court, uh, sort of the court. And you know, if you want to see the king or get scattered by the king, then you have to sort of get through that electron cloud or the people around them. And so that is why this T to the power three halves comes in. But that will, you'll understand a little bit later, has to do with screening with other uh, electrons around the positive core that does this, uh, modifies the scattering. Okay, so that's one part. And this is our extra piece I just told you about. Now there's something else, phonon scattering. What is a phonon? Phonon is this lattice vibration of uh, the vibration of the lattice. And what happens when an electron comes in, the lattice is vibrating. Sometimes it can steal a little bit of energy from the vibrating lattice and go up in energy a little bit. Or if the electron has a lot of energy, then the lattice, once it scatters with the lattice, the lattice starts vibrating on its own. And even it doesn't give back the ele electron its original energy, but rather it dissipates it in the environment, right? So it's stealing electro energy from the electrons, setting itself into motion, and letting the motion dissipate in air. As a result, as far as the electron is concerned, this is a friction which is taking away its energy. Now, why is it inversely proportional to T? Because at higher temperature, there is no more phonons, so it can scatter more often, and that's why it's inversely proportional to T. What about the three halves? Because after scattering, the electron essentially has to stay almost at the constant energy surface, and that's proportional to KT, the density of state. 
so this point isn't very clear. I will I'll probably insert another slide later on. But for the time being, let's say the phonon scales with T, and therefore the scattering time goes down as inversely proportional to T. And the phonon essentially is a vibration of the of the lattice atoms, and that you will. So as far as the effective mass electron is concerned, it will see as if a potential moving up and down. Once you subtract the blue, the equilibrium position out, then you will see as if the extra piece of potential is bobbing up and down, and that's what this scattering is all about. So when you have, instead of one uh, scattering, if you have a bunch of them, then what people do is they say that the scattering sum up linearly as one over. Does it make sense? If something scatters every once in 10 seconds, and something else square scatters every other second. Together, do they scatter faster or slower than 10 seconds? It will be less than two seconds, right? Because most of the time it will scatter with two seconds once in a while, the 10 second one will come in. And so the, it has to be inverse of the scattering time, do you see? Not just summing it up. Summing it up will give us a long physics. Now beyond this, there's no justification of this rule. This is the old rule before almost quantum mechanics. And so this is really an empirical rule, no physics here. And because the electron can scatter with phonons, with ionized impurity, with all sorts of things, we sum them all up, and the mobility, the net friction, will be a combination of everybody, because everybody is trying to slow, slow it down. Now, if you see that 1 over mobility is also proportional to 1 over the scattering time, so if the scattering time comes as the inverse, the mobility of various pieces will also come as inverse, right? If there are just phonons, 1 over mu phonon. Just ionized impurity, 1 over ionized impurity. But of course, everybody is trying to slow it down, so the net electron mobility is the inverse of all this. Let's flip it. If I flip it, then that's my mobility. Now this one, I could have ended it here, but most people write it this form. They subtract off a mu minus, a mu minimum, plus add it and subtract it. Now this could be an arbitrary value. And they write this piece, the second piece, as something that is proportional to the number of ionized impurity, n sub i, you see in the bottom? That, and then in n naught, now these constants depend on energy. Why is the phonon scattering hiding? It's hiding in mu naught. So it will hide in mu naught, and it will also hide in n naught. And what is the ionized impurity, number of ionized impurity, remember n sub d, that is that n sub i, because i could be acceptor or donor, so therefore I have just written n sub i. Alpha is a constant between 1 and 2. Okay, so this is it. And this is called the Matheson's rule. And this is experimental values. In the x-axis, we have n a or n d, which in that expression is equivalent to n sub i, right? So you start with mu minimum on the right-hand side. Why do I start here? Because when n sub i is large, infinity, right, very large, then the second term will drop out. Only first term will remain, right? So therefore, on n d equals infinity, 10 to the power 19, uh, then we start with mu minimum. Now, as you go make n i smaller and smaller, in the limit of n i equals 0, then your final answer will be mu minimum plus mu naught, right? That will be a little bit more. So you can see the curve going up, and in between there is a transition. So the in initial early part is completely phonon dominated, no ionized impurity. The later part is a combination of phonon and pho uh, phonon and uh, ionized impurity scattering. Now let's look at some numbers. So what would you say the maximum velocity electron can go and mobility an electron can have in silicon on the order of a thousand, right? In silicon. For the holes, it is a little bit less by a factor of two. That's why when you design transistors, many times your NMOS, well, we'll talk about what NMOS and PMOS is later on, but one type of transistor that depends on electron is actually half the thickness, half the width of the other, other one because holes move slowly. Hose effective mass is more, right? That's why it moves slowly. So that's the result. We'll have to take care of it in the circuit to that they all provide the same current. Okay, so that's it. For the time being, we'll just stay here. But the physics, I cannot even begin to touch of it. Touch it. That is so beautiful. Hopefully, in other courses, you'll learn about it. Similarly, a temperature dependence is very important. Again, why this t to the power minus 3 halves is coming from. At high temperature, lots of phonons. Phonon scattering dominates. And that's what I said a few seconds ago, right? A few minutes ago, that the phonon scattering goes as t to the power minus 3 halves. Right? Do you remember? And that's why this mobility is also proportional to goes as t to the power minus 3 half. So high temperature, electron doesn't move as fast. It's scattering too often with phonons. That makes sense, right? That's no problem. And you can see in the inset that the exact experimental value is not minus 3 over 2. Minus 3 over 2 comes from theory. But if you look at the inset in the figure and in a log log plot, it shows t to the power minus 2, 2.3. So experimentally, it's a little bit more. Lots of people work on this. That's why it's different. But that's a separate